um, I'm going to talk about dealing with cause or effects. Dealing with cause or effects. So are we ready? Amen. All right. Dr. Old Roberts once said that there are two threads that run through the Bible and life. One, God is seeking to bless us and to guide us into a place of fulfillment. And secondly, the devil is constantly seeking to change us from the ways of God so that he can lead us astray and destroy our salvation. So there is a constant warfare between the will of God and the plans of the devil. Our study this morning is going to address the importance of identifying the cause behind the effects. The need to address it rather than absorbing too much time in dealing with the effects. So we're going to deal with it. So we're going to go at Mark chapter 4 verses 35 to 41. Familiar portion of scripture. I love reading in King James. So we're going to read it from there. Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41, and we have it on the projector. And the same day when the evening was come, Jesus said unto them, let us pass over to the other side. That's the destiny. We know where we are going. Let us pass over to the other side. And he sent away the multitude, and they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other ships, so they took a journey. We know the destiny, we know where we are going, we are going on this journey. But there arose a great storm of wind. I want you to, to keep that in the back of your mind. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat upon the ship, so that it is now full. God gives us the destiny, but he doesn't always give us the journey. The ship is the safe place. The ship represents the means by which we are able to move from one point to another. The water outside the ship is what is sustaining it, is what is upholding, is what is keeping it. The ship needs the water in order to sustain it. But the same water is now posing a problem because it's coming into the ship. What, was, what is supposed to sustain the ship is outside, and it could sustain the ship as long as it remains outside, but it's now coming inside. And when it comes inside, it now is a life and death situation. Verse 38 says, and Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. He was asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest not that we perished? He arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. There are two things he did here. He rebuked the wind, but he spoke to the sea. He rebuked the wind and he spoke to the sea. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Romans 12, 3 says that to each one of us, there is given a measure of faith. Amen. Amen. Romans 10, 17 says that we grow that faith by hearing and constantly hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if you're given a measure, that measure has to be grown. Matthew 17 tells us that uh, it talks about faith as a grain of mustard seed. Not, must, not mustard seed faith. The Bible never tells us to have mustard seed faith. He says to have faith as a grain of mustard seed. The ability to be tenacious. The ability to push through the most difficult situation. Because when fear comes, it cripples our faith and it makes it impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Are we there? They feared exceedingly, the verse tells us, and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey Him? 
Jesus is familiar with storms. This is nothing new for him. So that even in the storms, he can sleep. He never allowed the storm to distract him from his purpose. In fact, we had an episode where Jesus walked through the storms on the water. What the disciples were struggling with, Jesus was very calm and walking through. The storm that came upon the Sea of Galilee was basically a violent weather condition causing strong winds. But a storm can also be a violent disturbance of our peace. Storms are generally challenging situations that we face in our lives every day. And it doesn't really matter how powerful you are or how anointed you are. It doesn't matter how many years you have been a Christian, how many positions you have had and how well you have served. One thing is guaranteed is that storms will come against your life. It will come. These storms were very common in the Sea of Galilee. It, this, it was usually a small body of water, relatively 13 miles long, 7 miles wide, about 150 to 200 feet in depth. The seashores of, this, of Galilee was 650 feet below sea level. So because the Sea of Galilee was below sea level and surrounded by mountains, it was prone for sudden storms. So the wind will sweep across the land over the mountain and create a downdraft over the lake. And sometimes this was accompanied with thunderstorms, causing the water to stir into a violent and even up to 20 feet waves. One minute the lake can be very calm and then suddenly there was a raging storm. The story tells us that the disciples now completed a wonderful teaching. Jesus spent time and he taught them about how to sow seed. He, he taught them about the kingdom of God and how it functioned and how to function in the kingdom of God. He spent time explaining this to his disciples. And then when the evening was calm, he sent the rest away and he decided to go to the other side of the lake. And he himself went down to the deck to take a rest. And suddenly this great wind came upon them that caused waves of water to fill the boat. Immediately the disciples stepped into action and they began to address the effects of the storm. The boisterous winds was beating against the ship and causing it to be filled with water. The swirling water around it was moving the ship in its own direction. The disciples lost control of the situation and consumed with fear, all hope is gone. And that seems to be the final outcome. They were struggling and consumed with the effects of the storm. But they were also disappointed over the fact that Jesus had no concern. They called upon him and Jesus arose from his sleep he, where he was sleeping. He came out upon the hem of the ship, and he rebuked the wind, the scripture tells us. On one hand, Jesus began, the disciples began to address the effects of the storm, but Jesus addressed the cause. I wonder, don't miss this. The disciples were addressing the effects of the storm. Jesus addressed the cause. The disciples were responding out of fear, but Jesus responded in faith. The disciples were caught up in addressing the water that was filling up the boat. Jesus addressed what was causing the water to fill the boat. See, too many times the enemy has us focus on the consequences and not the cause. If you keep cleaning the cobwebs are not looking for the spider, then you are not solving the problem. Are you hearing what I'm saying? A cause is the source or producer of effects. 
The effect is the result or the consequences of the cause. So the cause and the effect refers to a relationship between two phenomena in which one phenomena is the reason behind the other. For example, eating too much food without physical activity will lead to weight gain. Eating without physical activity is the cause. And the weight gain is the effects. You can buy bigger pants or you can drop the weight. A few weeks ago, I realized that there were WAPs that was building nests all around the house. It was in the eaves of the house. We're from a tropical island. And each time you would break down the nest, they would just go and make one in another place. And I realized to solve the problem, I had to kill the wasp. If you don't deal with the source of the problem, you will always be struggling with the results. Hello? And sadly, we waste so much energy on the effects that we never address the cause. Adam found himself taking fig leaf to cover his sin. God dealt with the sin problem. We read further down in this chapter, we go to the next chapter, and Jesus reaches to the other side of the lake, and he comes to the region of Gennesaret, and there he finds a young man who is possessed with an evil spirit. He's moving among the tombs, and he's cutting himself, and, and, and they are trying to restrain him. So they put chains, and they would bind him, and he will break the chains and, and the shackles that they will put upon him. And when Jesus came on the scene, immediately he dealt with the demons that was inside the man. What was happening? They were addressing the result of a spiritual problem and they were not dealing with the cause. They were addressing the result of a spiritual problem and not dealing with the cause. One man while browsing through a Christian bookstore discovered a shelf of half price reduced items. And among those items was a little figurine of a man and a woman, and their head lovingly tilted towards one another. Could we get the next slide? Inscribing that figurine was Happy 10th Anniversary. It appeared to be in perfect condition, yet it was tag damaged. So examine it more closely, he found that the wife was becoming unglued from the husband. You see, many times it is not in the obvious, but a careful examination of any situation will eventually reveal the truth. When we take time to carefully examine the source of our problems, we would not waste time in dealing with the effects of that problem. Jesus addressed what was causing the storm, and as a result, he dealt with what was the effects of the storm. I wanted to get this. So we must understand that storms can suddenly come in our lives. But storms don't last forever. And storms don't leave us the way they found us. Both Jesus and the disciples encountered the same storm. But they responded differently. One was addressing the effects. 
and struggling and fighting with the effects of the storm. And the other just came and dealt with the cause. Storms come upon our lives, I realize, when there is a repositioning. The minute you decide to go to the other side of the lake, let's take a journey together. Let's make a change. The minute you decide to start right, look out, storms will come your way. It has nothing to do with I am living in sin. You just have to decide to be obedient. To move from your present position. You just have to decide I'm going to do something more for Jesus. The storms are going to come. There are going to be some violent disturbance in your life. And I'll tell you why. Because the enemy is not going to sit down and be happy about it. Storms come when there is repositioning. Storm comes when there is realignment. The multitude didn't experience this storm. Because they have gone away. But the disciples were obedient. Let us go to the other side. Remember Noah? God told him to build an ark. And the people laughed at him, but he was obedient. They didn't understand. They couldn't see the reasons. Joseph was obedient to God's word. And he faced some of the worst storms of his life. Paul shared about how many times he was shipwrecked and struck down, but he was never destroyed. When you decide to be obedient and realign yourself to the ways of God, look out, the storms will come. Storms come when we decide to readjust, when there are readjustments. The minute you decide to do something great for God, to change the way you do things, you're going to face some of the worst disturbances of your peace. Readjust some of your friends. Readjust your status. Begin to commit a little more in church. And I'm guaranteeing you that the devil is not going to come and pat you on the shoulder and say, well done. But when you're in the will of God, you're in the favor of God. You see, the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Storms are just a temporary distraction to your destiny. And when those storms come, it will prove your fate. Jesus tell them, where is your fate? I just came out from teaching you how the kingdom needs to function. Where is your faith? The storms will prove your faith. The storms will test what you are really made up of. It confirms if your shouting is true and genuine. Because it is not how high you jump. It is what happens when you land on your feet. When the storms come, it will challenge your confidence and trust in God. It will test your faithfulness. And that's why God allows us to go through the storm. You can never get to the next place until God tests you and know you are ready for the next level. So he allows the storms to come up upon your life and he looks to see whether you're going to struggle with those storms or whether your faith is going to step up. And begin to believe him. Jesus was riding the ship. Make no mistakes. The storms will come. And when it comes. Sometimes it brings fear. It brings discouragement. It brings disappointment. But it will come. Five year old Johnny was in the kitchen. When his mother was making supper. And she asked him to go into the pantry and get a can of tomato soup. I don't want to go, remarked Johnny. It is dark in there and I'm scared. And she said, it's okay. Jesus will be with you in there. So Johnny hesitantly opened the door. He peeked inside and he saw the dark. 
and he shouted out, Jesus, if you are in there, can you pass me the tomato soup? <laughs> You're never alone in the storm. I want you to know Jesus is right there in the ship with you. You don't have to face it alone. And sometimes we can get so taken up in the storm that we forget the master of the storm. We miss the fact that he is right there in the boat with us. It's inevitable, it will come, but he's right there with me. And do I walk through the shadows and the valleys of death? He's right there with me. I know there are going to be times that I have to walk them through, but he's right there with me. A young military officer and his newlywed bride set on a voyage for their honeymoon, and as they sailed, a violent storm hit against the vessel. The young bride became so fearful, but as she looked at her husband, he was calm and he was composed. And she became very irritated with him and wondered, why are you not afraid? And then the young soldier drew his sword and he placed it to the neck of his bride. And looking in her eyes, he asked, aren't you afraid of my sword? And she quickly responded, as long as it is in the hands of the one I love. You see, sometimes God calms the storm. And sometimes he calms the child. He calms the child. Pastor Lawrence Chewing spoke about the many challenges he went through in his personal life. His family, his church. He lost his church. He lost his job. It seems he did everything right, but it all went wrong. Out of that experience, he penned a beautiful song. The anchor holds, though the ship is battered. The anchor holds, though the sails are torn. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. Whatever the storm the Lord is, the Lord is allowing you to go through, Learn the purpose and the benefits of it. Amen. Allow it to build character in you. Allow it to challenge your walk in God. Allow it to strengthen your faith. Allow it to teach you the valuable lessons of life. Because the way Jesus handled his storm is the same way we need to handle our storm. How did he handle it? The Bible says that he got up and he stepped into action. He rebuked what was causing the storm. The Bible says he rebuked the wind behind the storm. That word rebuked in the original is, is not gentle language. It means to restrain, to reprove sternly, to push back. So Jesus was dealing with the force behind the storm. We have to quickly identify what is the cause. Don't deal with the, the, the symptoms. Address what is the problem. Find the root cause. If you don't kill the spider, you will always be cleaning the webs. So he is not addressing the effects. He goes right to the source of the problem, which is the wind. And the scripture tells us that he rebuked the wind. You see, too many times we allow the visible to control us. I'm doing a series of teaching to our church in helping them to understand how to create environment. God first creates an environment before he steps in or he puts his presence. And if you can create the right environment, you will attract the presence of God. 
So you don't come to God to pray for a blessing. You walk out your blessing. You don't come to God and say, bless my car and bless my finances and bless my home. You become a blessing. Hmm? You need to take charge of the unseen and take charge of the invisible. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 to 5 says, Do I walk in the flesh? I do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When he rebuked the cause behind the storm, he now said, let the sea be still. He calmed the wave. He spoke to the sea and he said, peace be still. In the original, he declared Affirm, he asserted his authority over his environment. He did not allow the environment to control him. He controlled the environment. Come on, I'm teaching you something this morning. So while storms are inevitable, the problem is not so much the storm. The problem is how we respond to those storms in our life. How you respond to every situation in your life will determine where your measure of faith is and your measure and level of maturity. I often tell people I don't have to be a prophet. I just look at people, look at how they're dealing with their situation and circumstances and it tells me where your faith is and where your maturity is. It tells me how much you trust God, how much you are sold out to God. Tells me if you are learning, if you are listening, or you are just gaining head knowledge and there is no impartation of the word that is taking place. Because when the word is imparted in you, it builds your faith because faith comes from within. And I begin to put my trust and hope in God. So when I say my God shall supply all my needs, I know it's all my needs. So I don't come before God begging him. I know it's already supplied. When we went through two years of COVID and the pandemic, I declared God that COVID is not going to hit my church. It's not going to hit my family. I affirmed the authority of God over the church. I had a few guys working with me, Brother Mo, Brother Ram, the whole world. We were, we were doing all the work in church as normal. We were together right through. That was the best time for us. We could have got work done in church. And we went through the entire pandemic over two years and not one person got COVID. Wow. Not one. Because I've learned how to allow grace yeah. and how to declare authority over my environment. I've learned that. That's why Matthew tells us, you build your house on the rock. First Corinthians 15, 58 says, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the love of the Lord, for you know your labor is not in vain in God. You have to come to a place where you are steadfast. You have to come to a place where you know that the anchor holds. It holds. So we shift from looking at all the effects of the storms. And we put our focus on what's causing it. And we begin to address it in accordance to the word of God. This is what your word says, God. And I'm speaking against it. When people come to me and they say, well, you know, pastor, I can't sleep. And I say, why? That's your bed. <laughs> what do you mean you can't sleep? That's your bed. Look, go home and sleep. 
Declare this is my room. You bought a bed to sleep. You have to start to declare things. Declare it over your children. Declare it over your job. Take authority in the name of Jesus. Uh, take back their life for God. Sometimes we allow the devil to do what he wants and we don't realize who we are. The scripture says, we are hid in Christ. Whatever storm you're going through, the anchor holds this morning. I want to close with this because I, I just want to share a testimony with you to let you know how this works. I know time is in us. A few weeks ago, there's a young lady that sits behind us. She came and she, she says that her daughter got a stroke and is in hospital. She says, okay. So we were gathered for our Tuesday night prayer meeting. She says that there is a clot in her brain and they have to do an operation. So as we were praying, I got up and declared to the church, there's not going to be any operation. We're going to remove the clot from her brain. We began, we began to pray and we declared healing over her life. The next day she called. She says, the doctor says they don't have to operate. The clot is clearing up. Yeah. She's flat in bed. She, she cannot see. She lost her sight. She has a complete stroke. She cannot move. Um, the mother is worried because she's thinking that now she has a, she has a, um, she's married a husband and a daughter, that now she has to take care of this girl. And she's all worried about it. So we assured her that she's going to be out of the hospital. Don't worry about it. She's going to be home. I stepped out by faith and began to declare healing over this young lady life. She came home. Eventually she came home. They wanted to get a wheelchair. We got a wheelchair from, for her um, to bring. And I says, you know, healing is at the gate, but deliverance is in the temple. You need to get her in church. So she's flat in the couch and we couldn't visit her in the hospital because they were allowing just one person. And so when she was home, myself and my wife went to visit with her. She was flat in the couch. She could see us a little. She couldn't move much. She could talk a little bit. And give me the, the opportunity for the first time to lay hands and pray with her. And we lay hands and we declared healing over her life. I didn't have to pray no long prayer because I already knew what God was telling me in my spirit. And I said, I'm going to come to visit you in the next few days, but I'm not going to come inside this house. I want you to walk out outside and meet me outside. And we're going to sit and chat a little bit. And she said, is that a challenge? I said, it's a challenge. You're going to come out. By, by the time we reached home, half an hour after, they called and they said, she is up on her feet. She went to the washroom by herself. She took something from the kitchen and ate. She's up and moving about in half an hour. Sometimes you've got to see where the source of the problem is. By the next two Sundays, you were in church. She came and she sat just behind us. We had the opportunity now to pray and bring complete deliverance over her life. I'm here to declare to you this morning that whatever storm you're going through, the anchor holds. You can declare it over your environment, declare it over your situation. You can take authority in the name of Jesus and change everything that is happening, whether that's in your family life, whether that's a sickness, whatever it is going through, God wants to do it.